Hello, this is Peter Gade with the USMLE RX Express team, and in this section of pharmacology we'll be talking about pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. In addition to knowing specific drugs, the step one also tests pharmacologic principles and pharmacologic equations. The four most important being the equations for volume of distribution, clearance, loading dose, and maintenance dose, and we'll talk about each of these in this lecture. But to begin, let's just talk about enzyme kinetics. Enzyme kinetics is the study of how enzymes bind to substrate and convert that substrate into a product. The rates of these reactions can be studied, and from this we can learn a little bit about the enzyme itself. Similar principles apply to ligands and their receptors. Of course, receptors don't typically convert their ligands into a new product, but they do bind those ligands with a certain affinity, a principle that we borrow from enzyme kinetics. More importantly, in this slide we'll also talk about competitive and non-competitive inhibitors, which have parallels in the field of pharmacology. The graph that you see here is known as a michaelis menten graph. The y-axis shows the velocity, or the rate at which the enzyme converts substrate to product. On the x-axis, we have substrate concentration. Notice that as the substrate concentration is increased, the rate at which that substrate is converted to product also increases. That is, given a constant number of enzymes, the more substrate that we add to the mix, the faster will be its conversion into product. Notice, however, that at some point, the velocity or rate levels off. No matter how much more substrate we add to the mix, the rate of conversion stays the same. We call this saturation. In other words, our hundred molecules of enzyme are converting substrate as fast as they can. And adding more substrate only means that these substrates have to quote-unquote wait in line. Said differently, the 100 molecules of enzyme are all occupied, and the additional substrate has to wait its turn before it can bind to free enzyme. Therefore, at saturating levels of substrate, we say that the enzyme is at V max, or maximum velocity. The only way to increase the maximum velocity of the reaction is by adding more enzymes. That is, if we added 100 more molecules of enzyme, we would expect the V max to increase. And this is what we mean when we say Vmax is proportional to the enzyme concentration. The Km, which stands for the Michaelis constant, is the amount of substrate needed for the reaction to proceed at 50% of the maximum velocity. That is, an enzyme which requires very little substrate to be present to reach 50% of maximum velocity is set to have a high affinity for that substrate. On the other hand, if it takes a great deal of substrate for the enzyme to reach 50%, then we say that the enzyme has a low affinity for its substrate. The first thing to note is that the Km is given as a concentration. That is, the units for Km is the same as the units for concentration. The second thing to realize is that the Km is an inherent property of the enzyme. In other words, it doesn't matter how many molecules of enzyme we use. If we were to use 5 molecules or 500 molecules, the Km of that particular enzyme stays the same. Again, because it is an inherent characteristic of the enzyme. Finally, be sure to keep this relationship straight. Lower values of Km means higher affinity for the substrate. And this should make sense, because as we've mentioned, if it only takes a very little amount of substrate to reach 50% of the maximum velocity, then the enzyme must have a great affinity for its substrate. The second graph is just a different way of showing the variables of the first. This graph is known as a linweaver burke plot. In this graph, the y-axis is not velocity, but the inverse of velocity, that is, 1 over the velocity. And the x-axis is not substrate, but is 1 over the substrate. The linweaver burke plot is useful when we're trying to determine whether a new molecule or chemical is either a competitive or non-competitive inhibitor of our enzyme. First, let's mention in our original plot that the x-intercept of our data points reflects the Michaelis constant. That is, it's the negative inverse of the Michaelis constant. The y-intercept, on the other hand, is the inverse of our Vmax.
The Linweaver Burke plot may seem a bit more complicated than the Michaelis Menten graph, but we use it because it easily allows us to determine whether an inhibitor is competitive or non competitive. This line here, labeled uninhibited, represents the reaction rate of substrate being converted into a product in the presence of an enzyme. Notice how the line changes with the addition of a competitive inhibitor. The y-intercept does not change, meaning that the v-max has not changed. But our k-m has. It's actually moved closer to zero. A competitive inhibitor binds to the enzyme at the same site as the substrate. When it does this, substrate can no longer bind to the enzyme and therefore cannot be converted into a product. However, if we add enough substrate, that is, if the number of substrate molecules is far in excess of the number of competitive inhibitors, we can negate or overcome any effect of the competitive inhibitor. Because we have so many more substrate molecules, the likelihood that a molecule of substrate will come into contact with an enzyme before the competitive inhibitor does is greatly increased. Thus, we can quote-unquote dilute out the competitive inhibitor and reach maximum levels of the reaction velocity. Note, however, that in the presence of a competitive inhibitor, the enzyme's affinity for its substrate actually decreases. That is, the Km goes up. Of course, when the Km goes up, the y-intercept, which again is given by the equation 1 over the negative Km, begins to move closer and closer to zero, which we see here. This occurs because even in the presence of a small amount of competitive inhibitor, some enzymes will be bound by the competitive inhibitor and are thus unavailable to molecules of substrate. This translates into the appearance of decreased affinity of the enzyme for its substrate. Be sure to convince yourself that as Km increases, the number given by this equation gets closer and closer to zero. In contrast with competitive inhibitors, non-competitive inhibitors bind to enzymes and inhibit the conversion of substrate to product by latching onto the enzyme at a place which is different from the enzyme's active site. Notice that the y-intercept is unaffected. That's because substrate can still bind to the enzyme in the active site. The only difference is that so long as the non-competitive inhibitor is bound to the enzyme, the substrate cannot be converted to product. Said differently, the enzyme can still bind the substrate with the same affinity, but cannot do its job in converting the substrate into product. Apologies, I think I actually misspoke. I believe I called this the y-intercept when it's clearly the x-intercept. Sorry about that. Now let's actually talk about the y-intercept. Notice that non-competitive inhibitors, unlike competitive inhibitors, do change the y-intercept. Again, the y-intercept being 1 over v-max. In other words, non-competitive inhibitors decrease the v-max. This effect cannot be overcome by increasing the substrate concentration. And that's because the substrate and the non-competitive inhibitor, as we've mentioned, are binding to the enzyme at different sites. No matter how many molecules of substrate we add to our mixture, the non-competitive inhibitor will still be able to bind the enzyme at its unique site and inhibit the conversion reaction. A good way to remember this is with this mnemonic. Competitive inhibitors cross each other competitively. In other words, on a linweaver burke plot, the line that's formed in the presence of a competitive inhibitor will make a cross with the line that reflects the absence of any inhibitors. Finally, here's a table that summarizes most of the points we've just discussed. Again, competitive inhibitors bind the enzyme's active site, and they can do this because they actually resemble the substrate itself. Competitive inhibitors can be overcome or outcompeted by using very high concentrations of substrate. Competitive inhibitors do not change the maximum velocity that can be reached by an enzyme, but they do have an apparent increase in the Km of that enzyme. In other words, they make the enzyme appear as if it has a lower affinity for its substrate. Non-competitive inhibitors, on the other hand, show just the opposite. They do not resemble the substrate, they cannot be overcome by high levels of substrate, they do not bind the active site, they result in a decrease in the Vmax, 
and they have no effect on the Km. We'll reserve an explanation of the pharmacodynamics for later in this lecture when we discuss the terms potency and efficacy.